looks like we have a nice critical mass here. Uh, so uh, as you can see, we will be sharing the slides and the recording by the end of the week. And please, um, we, we don't have the Q&A box activated, but we do uh, welcome you sharing your questions in the chat box as they occur to you. And then Anita will ask the presenters, Dr. Rogers, Anita, Dr. Rogers, and we'll ask the presenters as uh, time allows. So thank you for joining us all today. And I will try to... Um, get articulate here and stop slurring my words. But at any rate, we're, we're thrilled to have Dr. Anita Rogers, who is a senior fellow for Generations United, facilitating our panel today. And she will introduce all the panelists. But I'm Anna Beltran. I'm the director of the Grand Families and Kinship Support Network here at Generations United. We're the first ever technical assistance center on grand families and kinship families. And we use those terms interchangeably to mean grand, grandparents and other relatives and close family friends who raise children when parents can't. We have been working on behalf at Generations United of these families for 25 years. Um, and about a year and a half ago, we received a cooperative agreement from the Administration for Community Li Living to build and manage this first ever technical assistance network. And you'll see there on the right, the eight systems that we target. So we're working with government systems around the country and with nonprofits around the country to try to help um, you all better support the families. So we don't work with the families directly because communities do that best. But what we can do at the national level is share all the good things that we're hearing and the promising practices from around the country that you can copy and replicate in your area and your community. Uh, and these are kind of the ways that we do that. We have um, webinars <laughs> of which this is one, but we have them very uh, essentially every month. So um, please uh, visit our website, which is at uh, gksnetwork.org there at the last box. We have a lot of resources there, including free events. All of our services are free of charge. And if you have individual questions like, oh, who's got a great kinship navigator program that serves those outside the system and provides concrete goods, any kind of question, um, complete that form in the top right corner and we will get back to you because we have an array of partners and subject matter experts that we can tap for their expertise um, as we're providing assistance to you all. This is a picture of our website where we keep all the resources and we're constantly creating written resources and video resources that will hopefully help you um, in your work to support the families better. This is a list of the latest um, resources that we have put on our website, but we are constantly putting new things up there. So please visit it often. Most of these are written resources with the exception of the second bullet, which is a 12 minute video, which is very powerful. I encourage you all to look at it. But uh, we, we, we do an array of resources, um, including monthly resources that are just two pages front and back. We alternate them between directing them at caregivers and directing them at professionals who serve the caregivers. Uh, and a couple of those are what tho are those resources that are prepared for us uh, through our partnership with US Aging. We have an, our upcoming webinar is building evidence of support for your program. Uh, and that will be July 17th. So we encourage you to um, join us then as well. And please um, stay connected with us. We put out a monthly newsletter with our resources. And as I say, we're constantly adding to them. I can't even keep up with what they are. <laughs> so that newsletter will summarize them for you and put them right in your inbox. So please um, sign up for our newsletter. And with that, I am the privilege of turning this over to Dr. Anita Rogers, one of our senior fellows here at Generations United and one of our important partners on the Technical Assistance Center. So Dr. Rogers. Thank you, Anna. I, I always say wrong, Anna, but it's Anna. So thank you, Anna. It's a pleasure. I'm so glad to see so many people here, over 100 participants so far. And this is a really important, all the webinars are important, but this one is particularly important to me because of working with kinship care over many, many years. Kinship service agencies should just not only rely on their 
regular kinship providers, their aging networks, and their child welfare agencies. Indeed, there are untapped partners that include agencies with a primary focus on children and youth and, and those with success in kinship, flair, kinship families, but they don't necessarily have them as their primary constituency. So we're gonna explore those today. Using untapped community resources, both locally and nationally, can allow collaborating agencies to expand their services, save money through cost sharing, tap complementary skill sets, especially when it comes to some cross-site professional development, incorporate more culturally relevant opportunities, explore new service models, improve efficiency, and strengthen their value proposition to the community stakeholders. We are so fortunate today to have some stellar presenters that can provide insight into how partnership with such agencies can support kinship families for mutual benefits. They will share why they developed or, in, or incorporating some kinship specific services into their programs. They would talk about community agencies who reached out to them and who did they reach out to in order to serve kinship families. And they will also give us some specific programs that they have for supporting kinship families, even though the topic may not say kinship. So let me introduce you to our stellar panel. Our first person is Andrew Russo. Andrew Russo co-founded the National Family Support Network in 2011, and he has served as his co-chair until December 2015, when he was uh, hired as its first director and relocated from California to Washington, D.C. He has worked and volunteered in the nonprofit social service sector at the direct service, the management, and network levels for more than 25 years, and he's only 35. Andrew co-authored several landmark, doc landmark documents in the family support field, including the nationally adopted standards of quality for family strengthening and support. Our second presenter, will be David Sherman, who serves as CEO of Big Brothers Big Sisters in Mountain Region. He has over 25 years of experience as well, serving in a variety of leadership, fund development, and program capacities for national and regional nonprofits, including Big Brothers and Big Sisters of America, Feeding America, Girl Scouts of the USA, and the Kansas Big Brothers Big Sisters program. David first volunteered as a big brother in 1990, and he is still a big brother by working with his little brother, Daniel, and they hike and they walk and they explore in the Santa Fe area. Our third presenter is Dr. Reverend Scott, Dr. Reverend Scott Ness, who is a senior pastor of Prince of Peace Lutheran Church in Fayetteville, Georgia. He is a gifted communicator that has taught and led seminars and delivered keynote presentations on three continents. He received his Doctor of Ministry from Portland Seminar Seminary, where he has researched, developed, and launched a concept for churches to empower members to intentionally form surrogate kinship families for the sake of building social capital in youth and children. And our last but not least presenter is Beth Lindley. She is the director of the Kinship Care Resource Center, a community program of the School of Social Work at Michigan State University. Beth has worked as a social work professional with aging adults and communities for over 25 years. Leadership of the MSU Kinship Care Resource Center has afforded Beth the opportunity to work with amazing colleagues generous kinship caregivers, and leaders across state and national systems in the service of promoting the well-being and stability for kinship families and the children in their care. If we could, we could all clap for them, but we are just so pleased to have these four presenters to share with you their, how we can connect with systems similar to them. So first up, our first presenter, is Andrew Russo from the National Family Support Network. So Andrew, you are on. 
Great. Thank you very much. Appreciate the opportunity to be with you all here today. And we are talking about family resource centers. Uh, family resource centers, we often refer to as America's best kept secret because they have emerged organically across the nation. Uh, there are there are many of them, and yet many people don't know much about them. So first, for context setting, family resource centers may exist in, in uh, community settings, like the image you see on the left, which is in Vermont, or they may exist in school settings, like the image you see on the right um, from Kentucky. Family resource centers, wherever they're located, work with families with a multi-generational, strengths-based, family-centered approach. So we see families coming to the programs as having strengths that we want to support them to further develop and build upon. And, and the work is multi-generational, as you know how important that is, is we're not only working with the child, working with the parents, working with the grandparents, extended family, kin, everybody that may be involved in the care and raising of a child. And they are designed for all families, so not just low income or highly challenged families, families facing a lot of challenges, but for everybody. So the image you see on the right comes from New Jersey, where New Jersey has 21 counties and 57 family success centers. That's what they call family resource centers there. So that means every county um, has a, a, a typically at least one and more than one, uh, often a family success center. So that includes highly affluent counties as well as highly uh, challenged counties as well, because the belief is all of us, all of us as adults and caregivers could use support with two of the most important roles we could have, being parents, being caregivers, being spouses and partners, roles that we typically receive nothing in the way of support or guidance for. So here are family resource centers to help us succeed with those important jobs. They provide services that are at no cost or low cost for participants and support families to build protective factors that we know are more likely to lead them to be healthy and strong, less likely to experience child abuse or neglect. Family resource centers bundle together many different supports and services that may be familiar to you already, such as home visiting, child care resource and referral, family counseling, food banks, bring them together in one conveniently accessible location that families can readily access. And it's also important to understand that family resource centers are not just a list of services. Family resource centers create communities. So parents and caregivers participating in these centers uh, join together with peer support and social connections, which we know goes a long way to reducing the isolation and stress that many parents and caregivers face. So Explaining how this looks at the national level, there is actually no dedicated federal funding for family resource centers. So they're not like Head Start programs or after school programs or home visiting programs, all of which have dedicated federal funding. This has all emerged organically as different states and counties and cities, public and private funders have learned about family resource centers and chosen to invest in them. When we first started in 2011, there were just eight states that were colored in green on this map. And now 12 years later, we're up to 38 states plus the District of Columbia, representing more than 3,000 family resource centers that work with millions of Americans on a daily basis. So um, with looking at this map here, you may see that the state that you're in uh, has a network, and I'll put here in the chat a link to the membership uh, page on the National Network website where you can click on your state and it actually pops up a snapshot that will tell you more about the particular network there, including the contact information, and how that may be of use in terms of supporting and working with kin and grand families is what we're going to turn to talk about now. So first of all, FRCs regularly work with uh, kinship families and grand families, although they're not thinking of them with that kind of technical language. They know them as grandma and auntie. And, and one of the benefits of connecting with this new network uh, is the opportunity to connect dots amongst our organizations that we can have more intentionality around that work. Um, but first and foremost to mention, there are already um, grand families and, and kin that are regularly participating in family resource centers. Um, so they're familiar with working with, with, with families 
already, um, and they can be ready partners for supporting families. One of the things that I've heard again and again listening to testimonials from uh, kinship and grand families is the, the challenge about accessing resources. And these programs that we're talking about, a family resource center, the whole purpose, the whole grounding is about access to resources. So FRCs in your communities can be great assets to helping families navigate to uh, the, the support that, that may be of use to them. And when we're talking at the systems level, for those of you who are working at the systems level, you may consider connecting with the networks in your state. So the network of FRCs to look at, are there opportunities to connect dots to, to partner, that they know about your work, that you know about their work, and uh, be able to uh, support families to uh, access supports. So a few years ago, uh, the National Family Support Network uh, worked with Generations United to uh, have a webinar that spotlight spot, uh, put the spotlight on this work in New Hampshire. And the recording of this is in the Webinar Wednesday library on the NFSN website. We have regular uh, webinars that are all free on Wednesdays. And there was one we had a couple years back specifically about supporting grand families and kinship navigation, looking at the story of New Hampshire. Hampshire, where New Hampshire had, had intentionally leveraged its network of FRCs to work in partnership with the Kinship Navigation Program. So when they launched launched the Kinship Navigation Program, the Kinship Navigators were FRC staff. So they're based at the FRCs. And it has just been an incredible success. Uh, we just featured them sharing the current uh, lay of the land and their successes at our um, big nat national event uh, we had just a couple of weeks ago. The recording for that is on the website um, as well, where you can hear the perspective, both of the systems, uh, uh, people who put together this, this uh, this connected the dots at the systems level, as well as a kinship family uh, sharing about her experience benefiting from it. And other than that, I would just mention other resources on the NFSN website include the, those links to the networks I mentioned and these snapshots as, as shared earlier. So hope that uh, this will set some good context for connecting dots with your important work and America's best kept secret, family resource centers and family resource center networks. Thank you. Okay, uh, Andrew, there is a very important question in the chat. And the question is, if our state does not have an FRC, how do we get one? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, so I would say reach out to us. We're happy to talk to you. Um, any any of the states that are not in green on that map are of particular interest to us, and we're happy to connect dots and and uh, see where we go from there. There are all kinds of resources on the National Network website, also about how to start a network and also how to start individual FRCs. So that info is also there um, on the website. But probably first and foremost, uh, reach out, and we're happy to connect with you and connect you with others who may also be talking about this. In, in those states as well. Thank you. All right. Next up is David Sherman, Sherman, uh, CEO of Big Brothers Big Sisters Mountain Region. David, you're on. See if I can unmute here. Uh, great, great to uh, uh, see everyone um, on Zoom here. Um, I, uh, I, I'm the CEO for Big Brothers Big Sisters Mountain Region. Probably doesn't mean a lot to everybody when I say mountain region. Uh, we cover a, a great portion of New Mexico, uh, the mountainous portion of New Mexico. So Northern New Mexico and Southwest New Mexico. Uh, I thought I'd, I'd share a little bit about our structure so that you're, you've probably heard of Big Brothers Big Sisters, right? But um, we are what's called a federated model. And so think like um, a franchise. Um, uh, each agency, each big brother, big sister agency is independently run. They have their own board of directors. Uh, they have uh, decision-making as far as the types of programs that they offer, how they offer them, make sure they customize it to the community, do our own fundraising partnerships. But we follow a standard model um, that from uh, Big Brothers, Big Sisters of America. And uh, what I'll be talking about today are, are our two most common forms of mentoring. 
uh, which are one-to-one -one mentoring models, uh, mentoring for youth uh, that are either site-based or community-based. So Big Brothers, Big Sisters is a mentoring organization with the mission of uh, supporting one-to-one -one mentoring relationships that ignite the power and poten potential of youth. Um, and our, our, our goal and our aim is that all children and youth should uh, achieve their fullest potential. So um, uh, the children we serve, uh, it, it really, it's gonna vary by community, but there's really only two requirements for a child to be part of Big Brothers Big Sisters. They need to uh, uh, want to mentor and they need to have uh, uh, some, some form of need for a mentor outside of the family. Um, so uh, there's, there's a misconception that we're dealing with kids, for example, that have had contact with the juvenile justice system. That's not necessarily the case at all. Maybe, may, may not be. Um, we do find that most of our kids are living in families um, that have higher poverty levels, um, and a lot of the children we serve are in single parent families. Um, uh, I, I, uh, um, in our area, 11% of the kids that we're serving are actually children who um, are being raised by a grandparent. And in our Northern New Mexico, uh, that number is well over 20%. Um, I just uh, a few months ago uh, was informed of a little brother who was referred to as being raised in Taos, New Mexico by a great grandparent who was 90, uh, 98 years old. So 19, 98 year old trying to raise a child. I mean, it's just unimaginable. And so, um, so uh, other things uh, as far as the kids we serve, they tend to be uh, at least reflective of the communities we're serving in New Mexico. Uh, we're a uh, Hispanic majority in the areas that we're serving. 63% of our kids are Hispanic and a good portion are, are Navajo and live on the Navajo Nation or in, in Pueblos. Uh, so we also want to make sure that our program is respective of and, and reflective of the, uh, the communities that we're serving. Um, I'll spend just a little bit of time talking about impacts because those are important. But the, the, the critical thing to know about mentoring is that mentoring is uh, kind of a power uh, uh, multiplier. It's um, uh, the results of mentoring are best enhanced when they're done through a partnership uh, model and through a collaborative. So mentoring programs, we're looking at uh, outcomes that relate to educational success, social emotional learning, social connectedness, and healthy behaviors. And when we're talking about children um, in particular who are being raised by grandparents and kin, that connector aspect becomes critical, making sure that we're connecting the children with opportunities, um, and, and with activities and, and with others um, outside of the family. Um, we, we do know once a child is matched in our program that we tend to, they tend to do a lot better in school, uh, less likely to get involved in negative behaviors, including initiating drug and alcohol use. Um, and most importantly, they report feeling better about themselves and their relationships with others. Um, our program does focus on, as I said, educational success, and what that looks like to us is that we want every child in our program to graduate um, high school with a plan for the future um, and with a mentor outside of the family to help guide them towards that plan. Um, as I mentioned, most of the big brother, big sister programs, probably the ones in your area, um, focus on two aspects. There's community-based and site-based mentoring. And so the way the community-based mentoring program works is we're working uh, uh, to build a, a program in the community uh, where uh, the big spends uh, some time with the little doing things out in the community that are of interest. So they're usually activities-based uh, and they're doing things they like. It uh, could be doing science projects together, hiking together, cooking, um, attending, you know, going to museums, attending uh, sporting events, whatever the common interest is, 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 is really what we do. And where the community-based program, if you partner with a big brother, big sister agency, can really um, complement um, uh, grandparent and, and kin programs is, is by offering 
some form of respite. Now it's not a respite program by design, but the program, if, if you work with your big brother agency to make sure that children who have a grandparent um, raising them, that they have a consistent schedule where they meet with that big, then they can know that whatever on Saturdays from three to six, my child is going to be with their big. And that's a time when I, I have to myself to do things that I, I need to do um, with, without the child around. So um, that, that's been a, a partnership that we've been working in Northern New Mexico uh, and, and, and are building with uh, the Lano Foundation and their um, uh, grandparents and kin raising children program, and we're, we're we're seeing great initial success on that. And as I said, about um, you know greater than ten percent of the children we're serving are being raised by grandparents. So it's really thinking about how do we intentionally uh, serve those children and 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 customize the programming for the needs of the child and for the parent. Second type of programming we have at most big brother big sister agencies is a school based program. And that's where a volunteer comes and meets with the child during the school hours. Usually it's once a, a week. Uh, usually it's over lunch and they're sharing lunch, but some of the programs can be after hours. Some of the programs can be before. Um, and in some instances, most instances, it's adult volunteers, but some programs actually run a high school bigs program where a high school student can meet with the child. So again, that's another form of programming, another resource available to kids that uh, a parent can uh, uh, recommend and enroll their, their child in. So, uh, so how you can get involved, um, I'll, I'll share the link here momentarily about how you connect with your local big brother, big sister agency, uh, but make sure that you're referring kids to, to big brothers, big sisters and other uh, reputable mentoring programs. Um, kids now, I can tell you, coming out of COVID, need a mentor outside of the family more than ever. I mean, kids, uh, it, it's so ironic that uh, we're more connected than ever to these devices, um, but children are reporting that they're not as connected to their peers uh, and to others and to their communities at just alarming levels. So uh, please refer children. Don't assume that a child is going to be stigmatized by the program. They won't. If they would benefit from a mentor, that's that's the type of child we, we'd like to see referred. Uh, think of being a big yourself. Each program has unique ways for mentors to get involved. Uh, we actually have a program here called intergenerational mentoring, where we specifically target volunteers who have lived experience and are older to be bigs. But we also combine that with outdoor mentoring programs where we have hikes that are guided for our bigs we, uh, so that they can incorporate the child into something they're doing. Uh, we also have family matches and couple matches. So if you have your own family, you incorporate a child into some of those family activities that you're doing together. So we try and make it as, as easy as possible for, for a person to volunteer. Uh, but the last two are the most important parts. It's, it's, it's spreading the word. Uh, as Andrew said, we, we, we don't wanna be the best kept secret of a community, right? I mean. People should know about this service, should take advantage of the services uh, um, and be a partner. As I, as I led with, um, we see that uh, the, the uniqueness of mentoring is that um, the outcomes that are evidence-based are, are, are across multiple areas, school, education, social, emotional, but those outcomes get much greater when you pair that uh, apologies uh, when you when you pair that with um, gosh sorry I'm just totally I thought I had all my uh, devices off um, it, when you pair it with another intervention so uh, if there's another program uh, that that we can partner with um, it it really tends to lead to greater outcomes for the child for the big that's that's involved and for the family so uh, lastly here. I just wanted to share my information. Thank you for the, the allowing me to share a little bit with you about Big Brothers, Big Sisters. Uh, feel free to reach out to me directly. Again, I'm one of uh, over 200 uh, affiliate CEOs, local agency CEOs, but we do have a national website. It's easy to find. It's bbbs.org. Uh, if you go to the Get Involved tab there, you can just type in your zip code 
and it will lead you to uh, the contact information for the agency nearest to uh, to you and to your program. So uh, thanks so much for your time today. Love uh, what you are doing, really believe uh, in, in uh, and recognize the need uh, of supporting uh, grandparents and kin who are raising their children. Be happy to answer any questions that you uh, that you may have. Thank you, David. And <clears throat> before we go to our next presentation, there was a, actually a notification in the chat by Mr. Burns, who says he has been a big brother to four kids. So we want to give him accolades and say, keep it up, keep up the good work. I did have a question for you, since we're dealing with the intergenerational component, David. Um, one of the programs that I've worked with in Florida, we just recruited older adults over the age of 60 and 65 to be mentors. Do you do a lot of that or what is your criteria for mentors? Yes. Oh, that is a great question. Thank you. Um, we actually um, here in uh, uh, New Mexico, 22 percent of our bigs are 55 or older. Um, I'm about to enter that category. So, um, and uh, uh, what we find is that those matches literally last twice as long, meaning they stay together in a formal big brother, big sister re relationship for uh, well over four years on average. And that's because of the lived experience that that uh, older volunteer has. And, and you, you bring with it that, that lived experience you're more likely to have understand the commitment you're getting into. And everybody likes to act like a kid again, right? So I took my little brother sledding. I never would have done that uh, on my own, but I just had a blast. Um, uh, and so, yeah, we definitely encourage that. We do ask the, the parent that we're working with uh, what it is they're looking for in a mentor and talk through them about the benefits of, of having a mentor who is um uh you know older uh, older or over the age of, of 50 55 um and leave it to them i'll also note that uh when my little brother got matched to me he had told his mom he didn't want to be matched to an old person uh and then he guessed my age at 30 something so um you know kids perceptions are are, are different for sure than 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 reality we have one more question in the chat uh, is how do you recruit the bigs? What are your primary mechanisms for recruiting the bigs? Our best mechanism and probably not our most effective because we want to recruit at scale, but our best is through other mentors um, and, and just, just word of mouth and spreading it. Our national office will be launching a campaign uh, this fall for recruiting. Uh, we work through partners, uh, certainly work through um, uh, employers and try and recruit bigs through that way, through through community groups. Uh, uh, here we, we partner with AARP. I mean, we just have a whole host of, of partners that we're looking to, to to recruit bigs. And that really varies by community, of course. Thank you, David. Uh, next, we have uh, Dr. Reverend Scott Ness. Uh, who's the senior pastor of Prince of Peace Lutheran Church in Fayetteville, Georgia. All right, uh, let me get this up. Okay. Good deal. Man, it is so good to be with you all today. I, I appreciate uh, just the chance to share and, and uh, uh, listen and share a little bit of my story and uh, kind of what what it is that, you know how I fit in in this puzzle of tapping into uh, resources in the community and and so uh, you you don't know me but you can think of me as any pastor in your local community um, and. Uh, yeah, their churches are everywhere, faith communities are everywhere, and so I, I think there's a, a great uh, opportunity to to tap into the resources of of uh, churches to to help to be uh, further advocates and aids and and help in your story. And so, uh, but but before I begin, I just want to say thank you because I was a kinship dad. Uh, the the two on the upper right, my brother in law passed away suddenly, and uh, so Summer and Avery came to live with us about ten years ago. 
um, suddenly over the course of uh, a couple of weeks. And uh, uh, we already had four kids. Um, and uh, oh my goodness, it was kind of crazy all of a sudden having six kids. And so I quickly tapped into uh, the resources uh, in our community and um, to, to try and survive. Um, and I know there are so many um, that you all are helping to survive in crazy situations, in hard situations, in beautiful situations. Um, and, and so it's, it's beautiful when uh, people come together to help children uh, find a way forward and find a way to thrive. Um, so, so that's part of why I'm passionate about this, this topic and what you all do and uh, want to do whatever I can to, to just say this, this is what is going on in our ministry, my ministry here at Prince of Peace. Um, and shortly after I arrived, uh, Miss Karen Gillespie, who I think is on the call, uh, knocked on our door and said, uh, she's a resource center and she's looking for partners to, to come alongside of and support. And I said, yes. Let's do it. Let's find ways. How can we help you? You know your needs. Um, and we, um, you'll hear me this, say this a lot, is in the church, there are lots of people that really want to help. And we often don't know how to help. And you all do. You know what you need. You know you need resources. You need people. You need all kinds of um, elements. Well, come tap into us um, because we want to help. We just don't know what to do, and we you you all are the experts. Uh, but we've got the 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 folks that are ready to to step up and do things. Um, and so for us, in in my context, what that's meant has been um, we pack foods. You know, we do uh, Thanksgiving boxes regularly. Um, every year we do Thanksgiving boxes. We're working and partnering with Generations Together to to give a part of our garage to be their pop up market for the the food insecurity that's a reality of kinship families and families and grand families. And so we've got space. Uh, we've got people that are ready to help um, and beautiful people that want to love on people. Um, and so you can tap into us. Um, and so we distribute, we, we have folks here that help do that. And we're, we're, we're the sweat equity. Um, if you're familiar with, uh, uh, you know, building homes with a Habitat for Humanity, we're, we're happy to be the sweat equity uh, to help you um, achieve some of the things and fill in the gaps. Um, I, I, I know what it's like to work in um, uh, ministries and community agencies that um, don't have the resources you want. Uh, and the needs continue to pile up, um, and and you got to stretch dollars as far as you can, and stretch muscles as as far as you can, and burning out people, and all that together. Well, I, I think um, what I've loved about our partnership with um, Generations Together is it it energizes our people. We love to do it, and and you've seen this, you know this, um, and it so it's it's just absolutely beautiful to um, partner with an agency that knows the needs and can educate us a little bit and and we can come and provide the people power to to pull things off and to make things happen um so i i you know there there are churches there are faith communities in your area um find a way to tap into them and um uh connect and and figure out um, that that's not always easy. Um, I know many churches uh, and, and places, uh, there's a, a pretty big door and a pretty big barrier uh, between getting in and, and staying out. And so um, uh, you've got unskilled laborers who are ready, ready to help, but how, how do you get in the front door? Um, it, it worked well for Karen because she said kinship. And I was like, oh yeah, I've benefited. I'm in. Um, not every pastor you come across or um, faith leader you come across will have that part of their story. Um, but there are people that have hearts that are ready to give. Um, and so you got to find the right person. Um, you got to find the right people of peace, I call them. And so maybe that's the pastor, maybe that's the youth minister, maybe that's the um, uh, the the friend connection that lives down the street that is active and engaged and you connect with them and, and say, hey, how, how can we get connected with your faith community to make an impact? We've got a, a, a clothing drive coming up. We've got back to school supplies and we're looking for partners to help us gather things and, and put things together. Um, 
that that's really been what what has really connected with with ours is just this carryover and crossover in our mission to care for people and and it's it's my as pastor of the this church we want to love our community and so we found in generations together a partner who is leading the way and loving our community and filling in gaps that that are significant and real um uh and so we're we found that that connection and we're running with it um and we're just yesterday i was helping a, a family that had just got kicked out of one place and just moved and they were she just got custody of her 11 year old grandson and so the the first thing i did almost interrupting her while she was sharing was go and get the the business card of of my dear friend who is in this so providing all the support and love that you all do for for folks in these situations um we can help you with food and i you know get you pots and pans but for the long going success of caring for your family um in this situation um i, I want to pass it on on to the experts um and you all are the experts um but we want to you know we can we can help and we can we can do those things um one of the fun things that has happened uh, for us with Generations Together is, you know, we've partnered with them, and then we're partnering with another organization that helps and goes and uh, cleans up yards and builds ramps for when mobility becomes an issue and somebody can't get in their house anymore because they're wheelchair bound. And, and so there's an organization that goes and offers free construction to build a ramp so you can get into your home. That's amazing. And they're constantly looking for more people to help. And Generations Together, our, our, you know, our partner group has people that are in need. And so it's just, it just makes sense to, to find organizations and, and cross points and, and make connections and network like you all already do. But um, I, I think the church can be um, a really good resource and advocate for making some of those connections and finding the organizations that are doing really good work. Um, with what you all are doing and what you all need. Um, so I, I think there's something people, so gathering together is that organization. And so um, I, I, I think there, there's a reality that, that churches have people that are looking to do good things. Um, and we don't always know what the needs are. Um, and we don't always know how best to help. Um, but I, I, I don't know many churches. Churches are really good at focusing on themselves sometimes, but I don't know any pastor that doesn't want to break out of that and look beyond the walls of the church. And so we're, we're constantly, just as a, a faith group, looking at how we can help support the community around where we are and where we live. Um, and, and I think you all are have a, a good uh, handle on what is going on in your various regions and various areas and the church can provide an incredible amount of resources, an army of servants that are coming, ready to come and love and care and support and raise up funds and raise up food and, and all the various things that, that are a reality for kinship and grand families. And so um, I, I can speak definitively that um, my partnership and, and our church's partnership with Generations Together has been one of the, the best things that has been going on here at Prince of Peace for the last uh, two or three years. Um, just working with them, uh, watching um, amazing things happen and, and supporting some good stuff that is helping our community. So um, I, I just encourage you to, to find uh, connections, use your friends, use your uh, relationships of, of people that are connected and plugged in uh, to the churches in your community and, and find ways to, to get a foot in the door to have those conversations and plant seeds, because I think really good things can happen. So um, you you all are the experts. I'm just I'm just here to provide uh, uh, some resources and some sweat equity to make things happen. So um, and and so grateful for what you all do. And um, yeah, so thank you. Appreciate appreciate your time and appreciate your uh, your passion for this important stuff. So yeah. thank you, Pastor Ness. Uh, it was interesting listening to you, and you were saying generations together. I just want people to be clear that generations together is its own nonprofit in Fayetteville, Georgia. 
Correct. So they, I don't want them to get it confused with Generations United. <laughs> so, Correct. Thank you. Appreciate that uh, clarification for sure. So that's right. that's our our local uh, family resource uh, group that uh, um, is is plugged in. I think with uh, Generations United to some degree, but uh, yeah, a separate entity. The yeah. the other thing uh, that was in our chat uh, that was was mentioned that Melissa had asked, oh, you know, what is the connection to the Kinship Navigator? in program. I don't know if if Pastor Ness, but uh, David from Big Brother said he is connected to serve on the Northern New Mexico Grandparent Kin Raising Children Coalitions from Big Brothers Big, Big Sisters. But I'd also would just mention that even though you're a church, the kinship navigators could be considering looking at grassroots community-based based resources to acknowledge them on their website not just the formal ones. So, and, and, it's, and it's not just, you are an expert as well, among well, other you. experts. And the last yes. thing I wanna ask, given that you are a church, the bereavement piece, because mm -hmm. some of our children are in kinship care because they lost a parent. And sure. if you could speak briefly to that. Yeah. Um... So I, I can tell a little bit of a personal story with that. My my two nieces, obviously, my brother in law died died suddenly. Um, and um, as a pastor, I, I I you know I'm in bereavement regularly and, and grief counseling and and talking with folks through that and navigating through that. Um, but a, a little bit in the big brothers big sisters uh, realm, one of the first things we did when my nieces came to live with us was we found. Uh, two just beautiful saints from our congregation and match them up as mentors. And, and I often tell that that summer, my older niece was, uh, she, she was, she's an amazing young lady now, um, but she was, she was hurting. Um, and, and Janet, who we call Oma, because she was a grandma, uh, taught her piano. And, and summer was not a good piano player. And, Oma never claimed to be a great piano teacher, um, but the music they made together was absolutely beautiful um, because it was a, a, a big sister, a grandma, an Oma, who was loving my niece in the way that she needed, um, in providing her a safe place, in providing her some wisdom, some grandmotherly wisdom, some unconditional love, um, and and the the other uh, my other uh, niece Avery went and she baked with uh, Janet, um, and uh, Janet was a pretty good cook. She was a pretty good baker, um, but it was far more about kneading dough together than it was anything that came out of the oven, and that tactile uh, love that was real, um, and and so I, I think. In all things, when, whenever you're going through bereavement, especially for kids that that can struggle to process things, but but adults for sure don't have the monopoly on how to process difficult things. Um, I think uh, a consistent, loving person who's willing to do life with you and tactilely do something together and and make connections and metaphors for life. I, I think that's. I think that's the very best of what we can do as as people um, to 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 spend time and invest time with one another. And so, um, certainly, I think the church and in, in kind of bereavement elements and and the the upheaval that can take place when grand families are formed, um, the, the church can provide a, a consistency and, and a reality. Um, there, there's a, a, a scripture that's often often used and often reflected on from Joshua that says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord and I won't preach at you. But, um, you know, sometimes I we can read that and say, oh, you know, me and my house, that's, you know, me and my 2.5 children and whatever. But but the reality of what Joshua in the Old Testament days was speaking about as a household was about 100 people. It would have been all the generations together. It would have been, um, you know, the extended family all living in the same compound, um, which which I often have used that it it takes a village, right? We, we know that, but it, it's a, um, 
uh, the more people that you can have pouring into stability and building self-confidence and self, uh, you know, social capital into people, the better. And, and certainly I think the church has droves of people that are ready to do that. And so that's certainly been my experience and, and kind of what I, I try to do. So, yeah. Thank you. We had a comment that I think is very, very relevant in the chat. Uh, Jeanette Matthew said the University of Michigan has a pediat has pediatric therapists specializing in bereavement and loss, and perhaps other state colleges offer something similar. And also, just for the guys, everybody who's here, New York Life partners with a grief outreach program, and they're looking to expand in what other populations that they have not served. If you look on their website, kinship care has not been noted, but there's a grant due for bereavement support for children. I think it's due July 14th or 17th. So I, I, I share that with you because it's really an untapped resource to support our children and their families. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Next, we have Beth Lindley who's the director of the Kinship Care Resource Center, a community program of the School of Social Work at Michigan State. Beth? Hello. Hello. <laughs> I had to get myself unmuted too. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Okay. So it's wonderful to be a part of this um, wonderful group this afternoon. And I'm... I'm truly humbled um, to be here representing one of many, many, many um, newly starting kinship navigator programs um, across the United States. Um, it's been an opportunity that's gone, been coming up, that's come about in recent years. And um, I just wanna say thank you for um, including me with, with our panelists today. Um, I am here to share a little bit about the Kinship Care Resource Center, which is one of um, four community programs um, through the School of Social Work at Michigan State University. Um, and that you know, may or may not make us a little different than um, some kinship navigator programs that are um, beginning many many start within child welfare agencies um, and state organizations based on the amount of data that's available. And um, ours was born out of a partnership with our state of Michigan. Um, we've actually been around since the late 90s when one of our faculty members, um, Dr. Robert Little, began a kinship care project that was part of his research and study and in my graduate program in early 2000, I remember we were learning about and talking about um, kinship as Hartford Fellows. My friend Rachel Cohen is in the audience today. Um, we were colleagues, student colleagues at the time. Um, so the Resource Center has evolved over the years since that time. We had an 800 line um, at some point in the 2000s. And um, we were staffed by a part-time faculty member with many um, student interns offering support for our telephone line and um, for the research and resources that we would provide. So it was at the end of 2019 that this opportunity um, came about to partner with Michigan Department of Health and Human Services um, through some funding that came through um, Title IV Prevention Services Act funds um, intended to help in the development of kinship navigator programs. Thus, our, our focus since that time has been all about um, building evidence for uh, a, to be a kinship navigator program for the state of Michigan. So um, as, as you see here on our slide, our, our vision is to be that central hub of information um, where information resources and, and referrals, the coordination of services in those referrals is made available to caregivers, regardless of where they live, um, in order to support the well-being of their family and the children in their care. Um, so I heard, um, I, I think it was, um, Scott, you mentioned being experts, and, and really we 
hold kinship caregivers as the experts in their own lives. Um, we, uh, you know, had a start as a grassroots grassroots organization belonging to um, a coalition across the state. And um, that was the Michigan Kinship Care Coalition. Uh, one of our steering committee members is here today as well, Dave Burns. Um, this coalition has been a powerful voice um, on behalf of kinship caregivers in Michigan. And it was really the dogged efforts of that coalition. Um, I, I give myself no credit um, within that process that achieved the creation um, of and the support and recognition of a navigator program in the state of Michigan, as well as a state run kinship advisory council. So, um, you know, the advocacy efforts of people with lived experiences and champions who care for them can really um, can really make the difference in building and making sure that something can become available and recognized and funded. Um, so it has been um, our intention then, since having some additional resources to learn as much as possible from caregivers, both in focus groups and in our consultations with them through our toll free line, to learn about what they need, what is meaningful for them, how they need it, how they'd like to receive the information and support. Um, and it's uh, based on that um, information and their support, their participation in the coalition and in the advisory council that we continue to develop and iterate um, the services that we make available. So our current services um, have been largely facilitated by a very small group, a small but mighty group of us on our staff. Um, it's been me and two part-time navigators until last year when we were able to add three additional positions, um, a full-time case manager, a legal advocate, and um, a program administrator to help support the many, many, many different administrative activities that we're involved in. Um, but in that time and with our small but mighty group, we've developed and curated a lot of information um, that's available to us. And when we take calls, um, we are asking information about a family to inform and listen and learn about what they need. And um, provide that either electronically or over the telephone, sometimes in mail. It just depends on the needs of the particular family. Um, we've been working with um, our Michigan 211 services, which um, also most states have some sort of a 211 system available to them. Um, I lived in Illinois for 18 years, and I know that we did too, and Cook County had their own very involved system. 211 in Michigan has been amazing and their um, technological prowess has really helped us build and develop and further curate the digital resources that are made available through our website. Um, ongoing development of training and educational workshops for kinship families, as well as providing some training for um, uh, child welfare, staff, employees, um, CPS, foster care. Um, there's so much complexity to serving kinship families. Um, you know, I, when thinking about families are the experts, I, I came to be a, um, a social worker in aging services because I lived in close proximity to my own grandparents, both maternal and paternal. I had the advantage and privilege of them in my life and their support to my parents and um, uh, this true authentic safe haven really for me my um, maternal grandparents were next door um, but that's a very different category of of multi-generational support um, because it was very active planned voluntary our family system was there to work together to support each other in lots of ways. And what happens for kinship caregivers, whether they're in the foster care system 
or not at all. And in what we categorize as an informal family, um, they have, what they do have in common is that they didn't plan this. Um, there's usually a very traumatic circumstance, loss or situation. It's always traumatic for children to be separated from their parents, regardless of what the actual reason was. And um, the caregivers themselves are just usually not prepared for the circumstances. They don't, they might not necessarily have the room in their home. Um, they might not have, uh, you know, they might be just fine financially on the, the current um, income that they have planned for in their retirement, possibly if they're a grandparent. And now with three additional children, that's not gonna be a realistic way of raising those kids. So, um, you know, depending on the circumstances, the trauma, the losses, and then the legal relationships, there's so much to understand. And um, we spend a lot of time actually helping can, uh, caregivers themselves understand what that means for them based on what informed their current situation um, and what their current legal relationship is that will inform what kind of services they may or may not be eligible for. So we spend a lot of time listening and talking through um, to clarify um, what those circumstances are for each family that we talk to. And the trainings and workshops help with that too. We believe that um, families need social support and being able to hear from others in similar circumstances makes such a huge difference in recognizing that I'm not alone in this journey. Um, so we keep track of all of the support groups for kinship families, as well as foster care families, um, and some that are specific to loss as well. Um, and we have a calendar uh, in the Help Center on our website that um, helps families locate where a, a support group might be for them. And then I referenced our um, coalition and the um, Kinship Advisory Council partnering and learning and cold calling organizations like Big Brothers Big Sisters, like the Family Resource, Resource Centers, um, just countless organizations, the foster care um, private organizations, foster closets, the better our relationships are with those organizations across the state, the stronger and more likely we are to be able to build a connection when we talk to a family and help them um, get in touch with local resources that are gonna be most in support. Because after all, we're, we're this extended 1-800 line and, and they really need to be connected with people locally to them. Um, and we are working on building, I, I've been a part of um, some really, really rich national conversations about what this means to be a kinship navigator program and information and, re and referral is still, you know, it's not, we, as much as we want to walk alongside families, um, that's still, there's still a distance there and um, ultimately a reliance on others to be able to provide supports and services. And that's good, but we also would like to um, have more support um, available on our staff through our services. And so right now we're piloting enhanced case management services um, with a family advocate position who is working more hand in hand with families in two counties. Um, and I'll show you how we hope to expand that. Um, this gives you a visual idea of um, the many tendrils that we have going on here. So we've got our service delivery um, with our 800 line, our navigators, legal advocate, and our um, pilot of care management services. We also help with coordinating and applying for benefits. Um, and so we've got some student employees that work with us right now who will help assess a family um, as to whether they're eligible for the child only grant. For example, if they're in the informal category, they could apply for cash assistance um, and few families um, know that that would be something that they might be eligible for. Um, lots of engagement and outreach 
kinship caregivers themselves don't always necessarily know that what they're doing is kinship care. That's it's a name that has historic um, origins, but we're using that in a more formal way now. But an aunt raising her niece and nephew doesn't necessarily say, I'm a kinship caregiver for my niece and nephew. So raising awareness and understanding about what we mean when we talk about kinship care. This is not just um, grandparents out of the kindness of their hearts saying, I would love to raise my grandchildren. It's usually far more fraught with anxiety and loss and unrealized expectations and um, lots of stressors. Um, so uh, making sure that we're getting the word out and making sure that caregivers themselves, but then all of those who might potentially serve them understand who we're talking about and why it's important to help them and support them. Um, our service coordination efforts with the Support groups, agencies, and 211, and now a new advisory council that was founded um, at the beginning of 2022. So, what we're aiming for is an expanded um, regional division of um, service areas in the state. So, I, I threw this up here just to let you know that we're going to launch an effort we're calling Michigan. We don't have our contracts formalized yet, but we're really excited that in these seven regions of the state of Michigan, we'll be able to partner with organizations, with nonprofits. Um, it could involve a, evolve a family resource center. I can't talk about exactly who those organizations are, um, but we're really excited about this opportunity to collaborate um, teach others about our model and have them join us in, in serving kinship families. And um, here is our information. I also um, dropped it in the chat earlier. And I'll, um, I'll send that out to you so that you have it. I, I think that our slides with all of our presentations will be shared out with everybody following our presentation today. I hope I didn't chatter on too long. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much. We had a couple of uh, notations in the chat, which I think are, are meaningful. Uh, Jeanette was talking about the bereavement component in University of Michigan, and she put in the chat, the link to that program. So others, even if you don't have it, may be a model for you to reach out to them to see if that's something that you want to replicate. Patrick talked about, it's called the Unite Us platform that coordinates referral sources within your area. And our, our own David, our presenter says he has used that and has been successful, I believe, in the Santa Fe office. And there was a question for you, Beth. If they the, uh, from Brooks said, what kind of training do students get in order to be able to support the clientele? Um, well, they are social work students for one thing, um, and um, they are on. They're part of our our paid staff team. So we also have social work interns that support some of our efforts. But um, aside from that, our um, our support specialists or eligibility specialists receive training from us about kinship, the same as we would train our navigators. They have to learn about our CRM that we use to track data and information. So we train them. Um, and then in addition to that, they participate in um, a Michigan, um, there's a actually a, a navigator program through um, my Bridges, which um, offers organizations an opportunity to learn how to walk through the My Bridges application, which gives applicants access to Medicaid, child care assistance, um, cash assistance, and uh, and food assistance. So um, they are pretty extensively trained, and um, and then we meet with them for supervision on a weekly basis, the way we would other social work staff and interns as well, just to troubleshoot if there are additional resources needed, they're referred back to the navigator. Thank you, Beth. And now we're gonna open it up to all of our panelists and 
I have some questions and I want you to please put in the chat if you have some questions because we have them here, they're a captive audience, so we need to use them as much as we can. Uh, one of the questions that I have is, you've been partners, all of you have been partners on sub level. What have you seen as the greatest benefits to the families from partnering with kinship care agencies or resources? Anybody? Shall I have to call on somebody? I used to be a teacher. Well, I, I can <laughs> go ahead. Um, I, I can say that um, it's, it's like building a community in a village. And so we've had members of the coalition who are providers of other services and they refer to us and we refer to them. Um, and so what families receive then is just a multiplied number of people. I don't think at this point it's too many hands in the kitchen. I, I think it's more about um, people who are truly showing that they care and are responsive to what their needs are and are listening um, and um, sincerely um, working to help them get what they need. There, there is a lack of some financial supports, especially um, for families who are, are not a part of the formal foster care system. And it, you know, there's meaning in, in having someone to listen to you, and yet there's still frustration about that at times. So we just work to support them emotionally with that as well. It's, we've got lots of growing and improving to do where that's concerned. Another question, I don't have any in the chat yet, so I'll keep asking the questions. What are some of the challenges that your organizations have had in reaching and reaching out and engaging and serving kinship fam families? And how have you overcome those challenges? No one's had challenges in, in engaging kinship care families. Oh, yes. I just, I, I want to make sure that I'm not the only one um, opening my mouth. Um, here's what I'll say. In, in One of the reasons why there's not really a national number for, you know, kinship navigator programs um, is that we're, diff we're all different depending on the laws in each state. Um, so... In the state of Michigan and in our relationship with the state of Michigan, we receive a list of new relative placements from them every month. And we do outreach to those families. We send a letter to them, we introduce ourselves, we thank them for taking on um, this really important task, um, this really important loving relationship that they are now engaging with in a new and different way a lot of the time. Um, and then we call them and we have permission to do that through that relationship. It's an entirely different story to reach the families that have not come through that system. And, you know, nobody wants to have their family called because of an abuse or neglect situation. And, you know, that's where those placements arrive, their removals through Child Protective Services so finding those arrangements where families have brokered with one another on how they're going to do this, you know, um, maybe it's a military deployment and uh, the mother of three children just, re, you know, talks to her parents and makes arrangements and gives them power of attorney. Um, or maybe the family shows up at the hospital in a, an emergency before there's ever any opportunity for an investigation to take place, the, the child isn't abandoned, but now parent is either incapacitated or, or dies and family just step in. Um, so reaching those families is can be really challenging, which is why as much as I hate to spend money on marketing um, and outreach efforts, uh, it's a really important part of what we're doing is communicating regularly. So building on what Beth said, uh, David, what kind of strategies have you used or public relations or 
keep public information and education and brochures, whatever, to engage uh, and let uh, people know about the programs that may be beneficial to kinship care uh, families. Yeah, that's great. And we're, I, I feel like we're still trying to figure that out, right? Especially post uh, pandemic, but a, a, a number of, of strategy we, strategies we use. One thing we, we've done uh, is going through the schools um, and working, working directly with schools um, to get information out specifically about our program. Um, also attending um, community uh, fairs and, and, and meeting families where they're at is, is uh, important and vital. And, and, and you know, there's, there's so a, a lot of that is just kind of like grassroots and being out there. Um, I think specific to partnering with um, families uh, where, where a grandparent or a kin are raising a child is just figure out figure out where that is where where we I mean we can find them uh, certainly as we go to community fairs as we're working with the schools as we're uh, promoting our program on on social media and so forth um, but each at least in New Mexico we don't have a statewide coalition and so it's county by county and and even within counties it's community by community and trying to to build relationships and get the word out um it was mentioned someone someone mentioned uh the unite us platform that has helped us uh in getting uh the word out about our services and also in making referrals to other other agencies uh in the santa fe area and, and surrounding area um but that that uh platform is is only as good as the community that's using it and I, by that i mean you've got to have all of these providers on the platform in order to use it to connect and to navigate but that has become uh, uh, another way we get the word out and in fact we have a meeting coming up next week here in santa fe where our our uh, uh, program specialists will meet with other navigators and then through that just word of mouth talking about the services we offer talking about the needs of our clients and their clients and families um, is another way to spread the word, but but certainly don't have a a a, 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 a magic answer to that question. Andrew, I'm going to ask you the same question. What kind of strategies have you used to engage agencies, kinship cages, and and families? Well, I think from the the agency perspective, uh, that uh, we're looking to continue to connect dots of the systems. So. The, the states that have networks of FRCs, it's logical to then try to connect them with the kinship navigators and, and the folks who are thinking about kinship and grandfamilies in their states, and they can connect system to system, which then allows the connecting of the individual programs. Um, in, in regards to the families accessing supports, as, as people have noted here, word of mouth is the single biggest driver of, of, of um, uh, uh of outreach um so uh families having positive experiences at the at the programs and then referring other families is is key um and family resource centers have a particular structure called parent advisory committees as well and parent advisory committees parents and grandparents from the community who are engaged in helping to guide the program and hold it accountable to achieving its outcomes for the community are also involved in the outreach and that goes a long way because the the word of mouth of of one parent sharing with another uh the, coming to a program is more powerful than any brochure or, or flyer that the staff could hand out um we know that uh so that uh the, the having parents as partners in the process in the programs and 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 part of the outreach for them makes a big difference i want to ask uh, pastor ness uh i'm a protestant and one of the things we always had every Sunday was the church bulletin. And in that church bulletin, we would mention whatever, or someone would almost, I would say, advertise what they need. And, and periodically, we would bring in speakers. Have you ever done that? 
or would you consider doing that? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. There's, there's lots of opportunities. So we usually, we use our bulletin regularly for, you know, for doing a, a back to school driver, things like that, what, what things are doing. And then we have a number of special events, non Sunday morning events where we have speakers, you know, our men's breakfast uh, that meets and, and certainly would be more than open to, you know, one of you all coming, right? And um, I certainly come to Prince of Peace in Fayetteville, but go to a local church around you or, or faith place place um, and share. But I, I think another component of that is um, bring one of the people that you're helping, someone that's in the midst of it, in the throes of raising their kids. And, and I've always, always believed that the stories are what move people's hearts. And so get you know, uh, someone to share the story of the trauma they went through of all of a sudden, I thought I was done raising kids. And now I'm back in diapers again. And oh, my goodness, I was over my head. But this group came and showed me the pathway that navigated me forward and, and, and tell those stories. And I think you'll have people that will be advocates, um, you know, broadcasters, and oh, let me tell you about this organization and what they're doing and and spread the knowledge because yeah, I didn't know what a kinship family was until I was one. And then it was a navigating to figure out what it was. So absolutely. So yeah, yeah, Pastor, lots of opportunities. There's, there's a question in, in the chat. It said, Pastor Ness, if a kinship yeah. program can't make headway with a local place of worship, do you know if interfaith organizations are structured to help families or organizations serving families? Yeah, great question. Um, my, my honest answer is there will be churches that this isn't their cup of tea. And so my response is, well, the good thing that at least in most places in America, there's another church on the next corner. Um, and so in some ways, my response is if one says no, well, that's not the one you want to be working with go down the street and knock on the next door um, is part of my response. Um, and, and in terms of kind of the inner faith and kind of organizational uh, church life in America is um, complicated in terms of denominational realities. And, and so much like we've heard here that, you know, every, every organization is very different. And, and so there are some, locations that have a very strong interfaith connection, interfaith hospitality network is, is one that I'm familiar with, and that helps with homeless people. And so there are those types of organizations, but I found it can be strong in one area and not strong in another. Um, and so it's really um, about figuring out your local context and what, what what's happening there, what are the strong um connections and networks within the faith-based community that are thriving? And is there a way to kind of, you know, hitch your sail to them and, and run with it? Um, but but I found that um, many times churches uh, have a lot to do. And, and a lot of the, inner, you know, pastors, I've got a lot to do. And so, uh, you know, reaching out and connecting with other pastors continues to fall further down my list. But helping families in need, kinship families, that that is more exciting for me than going to a clergy meeting, quite honestly, but that's for all, that's a whole nother reason altogether. But uh, um, so I, I think you got to kind of know your context and, and probably the best answer is, um, do, do you know people that are in the know in your community that might have an idea of that? And, and how do you, you know, grab coffee with that person and say, hey, how, how can we leverage what's going on to, to help in this situation? There are two more comments that I want to uh, uh, mention. Uh, one, it says, uh, in Michigan, they're truly, and you may want to, you may be interested in this, Pastor Ness, to have, yeah. a, have a faith community coalition on foster care. So if we yeah. hear someone's doing it in another state, we may look at it as a model to replicate I'm in sorry. our state. So I just share that with you. I yep. think that's really important. Um, one of the other things, there was a question, how do agencies develop expertise about special and the complex needs of children and their biological parents and their kinship providers? That's to all of you. Anybody can answer that. 
Well, I, I would first and foremost say we're, we're so fortunate that this new network has started, right? Because I think that is such a key resource. And look at all the amazing content that Anna went over earlier that's available um, through the network. So I think as, as we continue to, first and foremost, raise awareness about uh, what kinship and, and grand families are, right? Because even amongst us as providers, it's a new term to, to many of us. But then um, understanding that more to, to understanding the key issues that families commonly face and what are the uh, what are the resources that can be most used. So for example, one of the things that comes up uh, that it seems to come up immediately is is the financial resources um, and different uh, rules and regulations around uh, who gets access to what. Um, and there's a lot of advocacy around that too, because that's the other side of it. It's it's not only knowing how to support the families um, in the immediate needs, but how do we address the systemic issues, you know, as a society, as a community? How do we come together and partner across these different kinds of organizations, faith-based and, and community-based and and uh, network level, systems level folks to say, wait a minute, like, wh why are we doing it like this? And and can we change this up? Because the reality of American families calls for something different now. Um, so I really uh, uh, um, credit and look forward to further work with this network to, um, to be able to focus on those things. We're gonna close out, but building on what Andrew said, also, one of the considerations other than the national technical assistance is looking at cross-site professional development between your agency and a kinship agency. So that gets at some of the issues that we're talking about, what are the needs? And, and what I see is there are not enough local cross-site uh, trainings available because there are some, again, Communities are different, but different. There's some generic pieces, but there are some differences that should be addressed. So I hope the agencies here that are part of our audience and our panelists think about some cross-site training opportunities for professional development, and there may be some money in that for you. Okay. So I am so pleased to have been the moderator for this stellar panel. I keep saying stellar, stellar, but you have been amazing and, and very, very helpful and informational. And as a follow-up to this panel, uh, there's going to be a tip sheet about untapped communities. So it's gonna give you even more information and contact points. And now that we've listened to you, we even have more information for the tip sheet. So thank you so much. And I'm gonna turn it over to Melissa for a closeout. Thank you so much, Anita. I'll be closing out uh, today. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Anita, Beth, and David, and Pastor Ness, and David, sorry, and Andrew for coming out today and sharing your expertise. And thank you all for joining us today. There is a link in our chat. Uh, if you could just take two minutes to click on that and provide your feedback about today's webinar and any ideas on future topics you'd like to have covered at our webinars. And also please just remember to mark your calendars for July 17th for our next webinar on evaluating uh, kinship programs. Thank you all so much for joining us. Have a great afternoon.